Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast. This is the podcast for June 5th, 2008, no, excuse me, June 10th, 2018, uh, Proper 5, Series B, and we'll be focusing today on the Old Testament text from Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Very familiar passages to us, one that we've heard over and over again, and certainly discussed, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. Uh, but it, this text, while familiar, there's one some things on that maybe we don't always focus on. We want to talk about uh, a few specific things as we go through it today. Uh, this issue of separation, separation of God and man as a result of the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. Now, obviously, the fall is a tragic event, and... Uh, well, tragic event on every level. I mean, Adam and Eve have disobeyed God. They have not trusted. They have disobeyed, and they find themselves hiding from God as a result. Hiding from God in their shame. There's no way that this can work out for them, and they know it. You see, the description really is pretty sad. This description of Adam and Eve hiding from God, from His face, particularly disturbing, really, because when God created them in his own image, they were united together, even as bridegroom and bride. They would walk together in the garden. They would talk face to face, a beautiful, perfect relationship. And now, because of their disobedience, they are hiding from God, hiding from his face. So you go from a perfect union in the garden to separation. And a scripture clearly tells us separation from God is death. Now, an important aspect of this event that is passed over frequently, or maybe just spoken of in a cursory matter, is, manner, is the issue of nakedness, sin, and shame. One has to wonder why it is acceptable to be naked before the fall and wrong afterwards. Well, in truth, it's not really nakedness per se, but rather it's that nakedness is equated with shame in the Old Testament. Adam and Eve are ashamed of their actions. They have sinned, and now, and now they bear that shame, and they do not want to encounter God face to face. They feel the need, and rightly so, but they feel the need to cover their own shame, to really cover their sin. So first, as you know, they make fig leaves. Fig leaves to cover their shame, their nakedness. But deep down inside, they know this will not be good enough. They know that God will not be fooled by these man-made garments, so they also hide in the bushes. Uh, still not good enough. So on each side of our text for today, and the text is verses 8 to 15, on each side of the text we see the garment motif being inaugurated in the Bible. Before the text, verse 7, for instance, we have man-made garments of fig leaves. And after our text, verse 20, we have God-made garments of animal skins. The message of this motif is is quite clear, actually. Man cannot cover up, man cannot pay for, <clears throat> man cannot atone for his own sin and shame. Uh, you may also want to remember or think about Isaiah as you read this for his verse that says, all your deeds are as filthy rags. And the parable, perhaps, of the wedding, uh, the wedding banquet in the New Testament where the man tries to gain access into the wedding celebration and garments provided by his own works. Fig leaves will not work. Filthy garments will not work. And trying to provide your own wedding garment will not work. In fact, you end up in the outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, as it says in the parable. So, God instead gives Adam and Eve garments of animal skins, which tell us, one, that God provides, 
God's the one who provides the covering for sin. We do not cover or do we not pay for our own sins. God provides that. Two, blood. Blood is shed in order to provide the covering. And in the early church fathers, along with Luther, by the way, they read this motif, this garment motif, backwards from the New Testament on back into the Old. And as a result, they identify God's garments as lamb skins. Remember, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as the voice of John the Baptist. Certainly this fits with the last verse of our text and the promise then of the seed of the woman. So as we, as we take a look at our text now here, uh, beginning at verse 8, uh, we begin with this, um, this Hithpiel participle, the uh, myth halak, halak. This is from the verb halak, which means to walk, but because it's a hithpiel, you're going to um, pick up frequently the idea of, uh, of a reflexive nature. It could be in uh, included here, so they uh, translate here as God walking. It could be God walking himself or himself walking in the garden, but that's why the hithpiel is, is used here. Uh, and so... Uh, we then go in the garden, the Bagan here, our next, next one here, in the garden. And this phrase, la ruach hayom, literally meaning, literally meaning for or to the spirit of the day or to the breeze of the day. However, generally what we do is we translate this, and, and rightly so, it's a fine translation, in the cool of the day. All right, so as we continue to take a look at things here, we now have the, um, another Hithpiel in this phrase. The, uh, well, if I can find it here. Wa yisto. If I get this right, the hiding of themselves, picking up that again, and the from the face of the Lord God. Think about what a, a tragic thing that is. First they talk to God face to face, and now here's the complete opposite. Now they're hiding themselves from the face of God, of the Lord God. Uh, man separates himself from the presence of God, basically, is what we're seeing here. And soon God will do the separation of man from the garden, as we remember. And God also will in, in, invoke this uh, separation from that face-to-face -face relationship. Remember, you can't look upon the face of God and live after this, after this point. So we still, though, we still see God's desire, God's will to, to maintain or, if you will, repair or to restore this relationship between God and man. So in verse 15, that famous verse, we'll see how God intends to use separation in order to bring about the ultimate reunion between God and man through the seed of the woman. And we'll, we'll take another more close look at that when we get there. Now, as we look on here at verse 9, the Ayeka, or Ayeka, right over here, Ayeka, this, um, this uh, comes from the, the smaller particle here of Ye, or e, meaning where. So, where are you? I have a lot of students try to make that into some sort of verb, but it's really just where with, um, with the uh, pronominal, uh, pronominal, with the suffix on it rather. Yeah, pronominal suffix. So, moving on then, 10, we'll see the, um, uh, the sound or the voice. You know, we hear... I heard thy voice, it could literally be, I heard thy sound uh, in the garden, this uh, ethical, 
the Shamarti, I heard your voice, the Kolka. So I heard the sound of your voice, or your voice, your, your sound, I heard. It's interesting to note that God is calling out here, singular, he's calling out to the man. He's only calling out to Adam. Uh, and the idea, of course, the, the idea here is that it's, um, well, let's, let's make, come back. Let me go back a little further here before I go there. I want you also to note how the Hebrew is structured here. Um, having the direct object before, before the actual verb is somewhat unusual. And so the reason that they do that, I believe, is that um, this idea to emphasize the voice of God. The emphasis is upon the voice of God here. Okay, and then uh, where's the Ye Rome? Is it Ye Rome? Yeah, here we are. This idea to be bare or to be um, naked. And then this uh, coming back to uh, the what we were starting to do before, if I can, yeah, the Wayeka, the Wayeka Ve, Wayeka Ve, meaning again, this is a this one's a Hifel form, and in the Hifel, or excuse me, that's wrong, the Nifel form. The nifel form here means to hide oneself. But remember, the nifel usually has kind of a passive sense of the call. I, I think it's very interesting to note, as I was starting to say before, that God's calling out to the man, not to the man and the woman, but to the man. And Adam answers in the singular. Could be a couple reasons for that. God sees Adam and Eve as, as a one unit, a family, uh, and he's the head. Certainly we know that's true. Uh, could also, though, perhaps... Now, perhaps the Lord's pointing out to Adam that he should have been more attentive and assertive in carrying out his responsibility as head of the household. The earlier context in Genesis seems to indicate that Adam is standing right there by the side of Eve as she is tempted as she takes the fruit and she eats, that he's right there. And she turns and gives the fruit to him. She doesn't go a long journey. She just turns and gives him the fruit. So... It does appear that, that Adam has been standing there the whole time, not exercising his, his vocation, not exercising his, his responsibility as the head here. So it could be that he's kind of that God addresses Adam specifically to point this out. Okay, so then as we look down here at verse 11, the the there we go. Labilti. And the rest of this phrase here. The labilti, as you may or may not remember, a lot of people forget this from their Hebrew uh, 1 and 2 courses, but labilti is the negation, uh, the negation that's used uh, for, for your infinitives. So that really helps to identify that you have an infinitive chain taking uh, right here, and the ability identifies that for, for you. So you would translate, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Have you eaten from not to eat? That's how this all kind of goes together. So I'm putting it all together there. But that's your infinitive chain there. And... Let's see, if we look down here at verse 12, let's, um, let's move this, oops, let's see, get that up here a little bit, there we have it, now in verse 12, there's not much going on there that you are not real familiar with. Um, this, in the English, the with me. Adam is doing something here, 
something that um, is going to um, be of interest to us as we, as we see how this whole discussion between God and man takes place as God uh, starts asking, and of course he's asked, where are you, and, and all of this, and then God says, and then the man says, um, the woman you gave to me, or you gave to be with me, which is more literal. Uh, notice what Adam is doing here. Adam is actually um, blaming God. But that isn't over yet. If you look at um, uh, verse 13 here as well now, you'll see where, um, where we get uh, the woman then, as God addresses her and asks her, what is this you have done, you know? And, uh, and she also passes the blame. And she says, the serpent, the serpent beguiled me or uh, deceived me right over here, to deceive, to beguile, and I ate. Basically, what's going on, Adam blames the woman that God gave him. The woman blames the serpent who God created, and as a result, they pass the buck. It's really not their fault that they have sinned. It's God's fault. Pretty obvious. I mean, and we'll see this again. I mean, the apple no pun intended, but the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because in the story then of Cain and Abel, when Cain kills his brother Abel in the field and God comes to Cain and says, Where, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the keeper, also called a sustainer, is the same as the creator. God is the keeper, as we see in the Psalms. Lord, uh, the Lord is your keeper, the shade on your right hand, the Lord, you know, uh, that language that Cain uses then isn't, isn't really pointing to himself as saying, uh, I'm, he's not lying, he's basically saying, God, it's your fault that I killed him, you're supposed to be keeping him, you should have kept me from doing it, you should have protected him. Now, that sounds pretty bold, although I believe that every time something bad happens in our world, we ask the same question, God, why didn't you stop that? You're the keeper. So you, you see this kind of uh, this, this pattern here in, in Genesis, the first part, but it continues on then as we go through, through Genesis as well, and all the way till today for that matter. Uh, it might even be a sermon topic for you there. Uh, underneath uh, also this deceived that we underlined up there in verse 13. You want to make sure you see that that is also a hifel, um, which has kind of that, it, it, even if you don't translate it directly in a causative way, it does have that causative sense underneath it, you know, at least that. Um, if we go on then to verse 14, we have that very uh, powerful word, a word that is the exact opposite of bless, and that's arar, or arur in this particular form, meaning to curse. There are other words for curse, but this one seems to be the exact opposite of to bless. So that's, um, that makes it a very powerful phrase, a very powerful word. Um, then we go on, Barak, meaning the blessed one there. Just, then we have the belly, that, gachonk, gach, eh, can I say it? There it is. Gachon, gachonka. This is the word for belly. You know, the, uh, the serpent will crawl on his belly uh, in the dust and eat dust the rest of the days of his life. Now, a lot of, and I've read this in commentators, commentary, commentaries frequently, and it's very unfortunate because it really misses the whole point, the depth of the meaning here. But the curse of the serpent is not crawling on his belly in the dust because God's not cursing the serpent. Serpent already crawls on his belly in the dust. Don't go looking at snake skeletons, looking for little old feet that 
evolved off or something. The reality is a serpent's always crawled on his belly in the dust. God here is cursing Satan using serpent language because we know Satan took the form of the serpent. So it's really God cursing Satan. You know, you want to be a serpent? Then you shall crawl like one in the dust. And what that means, crawling on your belly in the dust is a symbol of defeat. Whenever um, you conquer the enemy, uh, the leader, the king, the leader of the army, they submit to you. This is an Old Testament Eastern tradition. That they submit to you by being prostrate on the ground before you. And then you place your foot upon the conquered, the conquered enemy. The idea of crushing the head of the enemy, making him eat dust. It's a symbol of defeat. Notice also, though, you do it with your foot. And so your heel is also bruised or crushed. You know, that's how we get the language of uh, verses 14 and 15 here. So the crushing of the head and the bruising crushing of the heel. So moving on then to our last verse, maybe uh, the most famous verse here. The, um, again, God is speaking this to Satan. I think that's important to keep in mind. God is cursing Satan as he delivers the blessing, the messianic promise blessing to the woman and well, to Adam and Eve. So we have the word for enmity here. Um, well, yeah, right here, first word. Waeva, enmity. And then we have the, the ashith right next to it here. The ashith, uh, which comes from from the, uh, the root sheath, to set or to put or to place upon. Again, you see the noun coming before the verb. The emphasis is supposed to be placed on the enmity. Then we have a, a rather unusual form coming up here. The, um, well, actually two back-to-back -back forms here. The Yashufka, if we can find it up there. Oh, here we go. The Eshufka, very important. And the Tishufena, Fenu, rather. These are, um, they both come from the same root, Shuf. And One's a hofel and holeo. We have a couple different ones going on here. Some different ones are some different kind of uh, forms. We don't deal with that much. Both meaning to crush. So some have used uh, the idea of to bruise because in the call form, in the basic form, it means to bruise. But in the, uh, these other forms, the crushing seems to be much more intense than just bruising. Um, and so the idea of crushing, but notice, notice uh, the crushing could, can go on both sides, both the head of Satan and the heel of the woman's, of the woman, the, of the woman's seed are crushed. Now frequently this verse, and in fact this is how I learned it, uh, it's referred to as the Proto-Oyangelion, which means first gospel. Um, a bit of a misnomer, I suppose. I mean, certainly God's act of creation is an act of gospel as well. So this really isn't the first act of gospel. You could say it's the first direct messianic prophecy. Certainly before this, there was no need for a messianic prophecy uh, because sin had not come into the world yet. So um, first direct promise of the seed, absolutely it is that. And the one who will reun reunite, again, going back to separation reunion, through the seed, even though they are separated now from the garden, separated from the face of God, 
uh, all of that, God's going to use that separation now when we get to Abraham to set apart the people to preserve the line, the Messianic line, to preserve the line of the seed so that the seed will be brought into the earth, onto the earth. So separation is used by God in order to bring about reunion, to reunite all of mankind to him through the seed, Jesus Christ. God bless your preaching.